Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's latest Fennec Elliott webinar. My name is Stacey Sinclair, and it is wonderful to have so many of you here with us today. Thank you for joining. With me, we have Fennec Elliott partner Jatinda Garsha and senior associate Edward Kolkla, both of which who specialize in construction and energy projects and contracts, and both of which who are regulars to this Fennec Elliott webinar series. You may have seen Jatinda and Edward join us previously on two very successful webinars speaking on contractual liabilities post completion and negotiating construction contracts post COVID-19, both of which you can find on our Fennec Elliott website. But today's discussion is about tackling boilerplate clauses. Now, admittedly, despite having used boilerplate clauses time and time again, um, until today, I had never actually considered the origin of the term. And I was delighted to see that sources are pointing back to the 1800s, to steamships and steel plates that reinforce and provide extra security to high pressure boilers. And then apparently in the 1900s, those plates were reclaimed and used in the newspaper printing presses or plates resembling those, those boiler plates um, to print text that was used over and over again. Um, so assuming these lovely stories are true, that's not what we're here to talk about today um, in terms of the origin. So I will hand over to the experts to give us the ins and outs of these clauses. Um, but before I do so, just two points on housekeeping. Uh, you are on mute of course, um, and please do submit questions at, as we go. There should be time at the end for um, a few of those. And rest assured that the slides and a recording of this webinar will be available on our website in due course. And I believe you should have a link now or shortly um, in the chat box, which will point you to that. So um, without further delay, Jatinda, I shall hand over to you. Thank you very much, Stacey. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining today. Um, in this webinar, oh, just ah, there we go. Uh, in this webinar, we we should be looking at boilerplate clauses. In particular, we'll look at what they are, why and how they are used, and their consequences, and whether actually they they are needed at all. We will look at some example clauses. We've listed some there in on the slide, and provide hopefully some tips uh, where relevant. And as Stacey said, at the end of it, hopefully we can have an opportunity to have some question and answers. So, uh, boilerplate clauses. So, in the context of contracts, boilerplate is the term that's used to describe those clauses that are included in the agreement to deal with the mechanics of how the, the mechanics of how the contract works and also those legal points that are relevant generally to most transactions. In my experience, boilerplate clauses are either found right at the beginning of, a, of, of the agreement and then right at the end. Um, in fact, sometimes these clauses are actually, you know, they're, they're often considered to be standard and therefore included in almost like the, the miscellaneous provisions. Uh, and accordingly, the provisions are often overlooked not generally negotiated. In fact, I think when it comes to the miscellaneous provisions, there's a temptation not to pay them much attention at all, but which is what we're going to come on to a bit now is that's a very dangerous view to adopt. Now, just because they're boilerplate provisions, these, these provisions in the contract need to be considered in the context of what they're trying to achieve, just like any other clause of the contract. Now, you need to consider and, and understand what the position of the parties would be under general law if the boilerplate provisions were not included. And you also probably need to understand how the position of the parties under general law is altered by the inclusion of these boilerplate provisions. Now, ultimately, to reduce the length of a contract, we should also consider removing various boilerplate clauses if possible, if they actually don't add anything to the, to the contract, which hopefully we will we'll give you a bit of a flavor of on this, on this talk. Now, boilerplate provisions generally are included to, I would say, to improve clarity, and they generally fall within the four main headings that I've set out on this slide. So the first one is a, a provision that doesn't really add much to the contract, and by that I mean all it's trying to do is merely restate the law, whether that's common law or under statute, or confirm or restate the application of general rules of law to the contract. 
Now, examples of that are like severance clauses and survival clauses. Um, in, in other, another example of that, I suppose, is a jurisdictional clause. You, you tend to see a jurisdiction clause in a contract. Um, and if you're talking about international contract where there's various parties from, from, from different jurisdictions, then yes, jurisdiction clause is quite important to, to state exactly which, which governing law applies. However, in a, in a purely UK or English law or in English project where the parties are all English and the project is in England, there's probably less of a, less of a need for a jurisdiction clause. So there's, there's those type of clauses that restate the law. Then the second type of boilerplate clause is the one that's trying to preserve rights that may otherwise be lost. And I'll come on to that a bit later on when we talk about a non-waiver clause. The third type of, of clause then is, the, is one that's trying to exclude rights. So it's trying to extinguish or exclude claims under contract where the claims might ordinarily exist at law. And I'll come on to that again when we talk about entire agreement clauses. And I think Ed will touch upon third party rights clauses as well, which is, which is that. And then the final um, uh, type of boilerplate clause is the one that, as I've said here, that will seldom or never be implied, i.e. it grants a right to a contracting party which are unknown or not recognized by general law. And again, Ed will touch upon a couple of these when he talks about force majeure and termination. But in the first instance, the first boilerplate provision I'm going to talk about is the entire agreement clause. Now, drafting varies contract to contract, but uh, an entire agreement clause provides that only those terms set out in the actual signed agreement form part of the contract. What it's trying to ensure is that any statements, representations, notes, and so on, which were made during the contract negotiation and before it was signed, are, unless they are specifically set out in the contract, not included within the contract terms. As a, as a, as a result, entire agreement clause, clauses can provide provide certainty for the parties, but only if they are drafted correctly and they mirror the intention of the parties. Now, badly drafted uh, entire agreement clauses are a common cause of litigation. The reason to include uh, an entire agreement clause is, depending on the individual facts um, of, of each case and the behavior of the parties, there is a possibility that a side agreement may be created under common law throughout these discussions. So uh, what an entire agreement clause, as I've set out here on the slide, is trying to do is try to ensure that only any pre-contract emails, draft documents and so on do not form part of the final signed contract. Now, an entire agreement clause provides that the agreement is limited to material referred to in the contract and includes material which is not referred to, therefore thus excluding prior contracts, which could include uh, things like letters of intent, uh, exclude informal or formal arrangements, informal working arrangements, which themselves might give rise to a legal relationship intentionally or unintentionally before the contract was signed, exclude understandings and implied contracts, and also, to exclude prior methods or practices which at law would form a contract, i.e. something that might happen through the course of dealings between the parties. Now, if there are pre-existing contracts that are intended to remain in force at the time that the new agreement is signed, using an entire agreement clause can actually be quite dangerous. Um, and any agreements that are, are intended to continue should be expressly carved out of the entire agreement clause. It's also extremely important to remember that all documents which are to form part of the transaction are referred to in that in, uh, entire agreement clause. Now, this is probably more of an issue for complex projects where there are numerous documents, um, less so on a, on, a, on a more simple contract. Uh, it's also essential on these, on these um, more complex projects to ensure that the entire agreement clause or somewhere else in the contract also states the priority uh, in the event of any inconsistency between, between the documents.
Now, the purpose of the of an entire agreement clause was set out in this case in the case of Entrepreneur Pub Company versus East Crown Limited. Now, I won't go through that, but the, the courts there were, were trying to establish what an entire agreement clause is, is trying to achieve, and they said that it was it was achievable. But more importantly, at the end of this judgment, the court also said, went on to say that an entire agreement clause does not necessarily preclude a claim for misrepresentation, which is a point I will come on to in a bit later on in one of my slides. Now, the presence of an entire agreement clause in a contract will not always preclude the bringing of a claim or use of certain statements. For example, uh, having an entire agreement clause will not affect one, a claim which is brought by a party to a contract as a result of events which arise after the signing of the contract. So remember the entire agreement clause is only dealing with rep um, representations, et cetera, made before the contract was signed. The, the use of notes, negotiation, <laughs> correspondence, and so on, which uh, may help and assist in interpreting the terms of the contract at a later date. Uh, a claim for rectification on the basis that the contract does not set out the terms as agreed between the parties. And also, uh, it will not necessarily affect the implying of terms into a contract unless the entire agreement clause specifically excludes the implied terms. And again, implied terms is something I will look at very, very shortly. So just please be aware that any that pre-contractual representations made by one party to the other to induce them to enter into the contract are excluded from are excluded by another type of clause, which is known as the non-reliance clause, which is going to be dealt with in the next slide. Now, because the non-reliance clauses are intended to deal with misrepresentations, they serve a slightly different and distinct purpose to an entire agreement clause. Now, trying to combine the two clauses is potentially hazardous. However, I do on occasion see entire agreement clauses making references to representations. Now, the law of misrepresentation is quite a complex area. I'm not going to go into that in particular detail. But what it does is it applies to representations, i.e. statements that are made during the negotiations, uh, where that, that representation is either false uh, and is relied upon by a party and induces that other party to enter into the contract. So when a representation is made and is, is in false, it's, it's what we call a misrepresentation. Now, the position at law is that where there is a misrepresentation, which has been relied upon and acted upon or induced someone to enter into the contract, then there is a right for the innocent party to rescind the contract, i.e. you can put the, you can say that the contract is now null and void and go back to the position that might have applied before the, uh, the contract was entered into. So what a non-reliance clause is trying to do is to operate, is to try and exclude reliance on any pre-contractual representations altogether and establish that the parties have not relied on any matter other than that which is set out in the contract itself. I mean, the logic being, if there is no reliance, then there can have been no inducement to enter into the contract, and therefore there can be no misrepresentation. Now, I've set out an example of a misrepresentation uh, non-reliance clause on this slide, and effectively what you need to, what, what tends to be included in these types of clause, clauses is one, a no representation statement, which the parties provide that no party to the contract has made any representation during the negotiations or before the contract was entered into. Uh, and this, this provision can be included whether that's factually correct or not. Now, the courts have decided that, you know, representations may have been relied upon, but a statement saying that representations haven't been relied upon, whether that's factually correct or not, is enforceable, the courts have said. The statement, that there's, there's normally a statement that says that there's no reliance on any representation, which is not included in the contract, i.e. what we refer to as a non-reliance statement. There is generally a statement, as there is in this clause here, excluding liability for misrepresentation and also a waiver of non-contractual remedies. OK, 
Okay. Now, a, a properly drafted non-reliance clause is effective because it prevents reliance on an alleged misrepresentation as a contractual estoppel and prevents a claim being made in relation to misrepresentation. However, the issues you probably need to consider when you're looking at a, a, a drafting these, these type of clauses is that, and I've listed here on this, this slide, firstly, an entire agreement clause is not an automatic defense to an allegation of misrepresentation. So just having a general provision about having an entire agreement clause doesn't mean that you're not liable for misrepresentation. The, the, case is, the case law has been quite clear on this point. If you want to exclude misre, uh, misrepresentation under a uh, entire agreements clause, clear wording is required in order to make that uh, work. Uh, entire agreement clauses often include terms limiting liability for misrepresentation, but tend to preserve liability for fraudulent misrepresentation. Now that's because in the law, uh, the, the, the cases and, and generally in the law, you cannot uh, limit your liability or exclude your liability for fraud and therefore fraudulent misrepresentation is different to an innocent misrepresentation. Um, the, the reference in a clause of this nature to just representations doesn't necessarily mean that it will capture misrepresentations and that was decided in, in a case called AXA Sun Life Services versus Campbell uh, Martin Limited in 2011 where the courts found that the reference to misrepresentation did not expressly exclude misrepresentation. And then finally, just quickly on, on misrepresentation, again, case law has shown that misrepresentation statements of this nature and non-reliant statements can be valid. And what they're trying to do as, as a, at law is they're trying to exclude liability for misrepresentation. And accordingly, Section 3 of the Misrepresentation Act 1967 applies, which provides that any such wording is subject to the reasonableness test under the under UCTA 1977. Now, obviously, contracts that are, are negotiated heavily between parties that have taken legal advice, have similar business experience and equal bargaining power, in those kind of circumstances, it, it's going to be quite easy to get over this <coughs> reasonable test hurdle. The other thing is I was just going to touch upon implied terms. Now, implied, the implied terms, uh, though not especially set out in a contract, can be implied into a contract for various reasons. Um, and the Marks and Spencer case said one of those reasons is for business efficiency, i.e. it is required to make the contract work, not just because it's reasonable for that provision to be included. And again, when it comes to implied terms, the courts have had to decide whether an, agree an entire agreement clause can actually exclude implied terms. Uh, and what the courts have had to look at and consider is whether an implied term is, a separate, is separate to the contract and so can be excluded under entire agreement clause in the same way as a pre-contractual -con pre statement is, or whether they are form part of the contract generally and therefore cannot be excluded. And I think the case, the case law has shown that when it comes to implied terms, the courts are looking to dif differentiate the implied terms between what one, what they refer to as an, an intrinsic implied term and what is, imp is referred to as a non-intrinsic uh, 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 implied term. Now, an intrinsic implied term is, as the name suggests, an implied term that is intrinsic to the actual agreement. And it was a considered, it is considered to form part of the actual contract and therefore cannot be excluded. And that was again decided in the in the Access Sun Life case. Conversely, it, it would appear that a non-intrinsic implied term, for example, implied terms that are, arise as a result of a particular trade usage or custom or previous course of dealings, can be excluded by an entire agreement clause. Um, however, in, in order to do that, you need to use express wording, and I've, I've put some wording there on the slide, maybe using something along the lines of usage or course of dealings within that, that entire agreement clause. Mm -hmm. 
However, just bear in mind that what is an, <laughs> a non-intrinsic uh, implied term is, is in this context actually quite unclear. And then finally, just before handing over to Ed, I was just going to have a really quick look at waiver clauses. Again, there's a waiver clause on there. So what happens at law, again, trying to understand why a boilerplate clause is, is, is included, what could happen at law is if a party takes too long to enforce a right, then it loses that right. So waivers can, can occur when a party has a legal right and it abandons that legal right, either in express words or through its conduct. Um, and that waiver can be expressed or it can be implied. And the other party has acted on that statement and eventually, ultimately, it would be inequitable for that innocent party then to try to reinforce that right after it's kind of shown that it's, it's looking to abandon that right. So where a legal party, uh, where a party has a legal right and chooses not to exercise it, it's prevented from going back and trying at a later date to enforce that right. And therefore, it loses its claim to breach a contract and eventually, obviously, ultimately losing its claim for any damages flowing from that. So what a non-waiver, one waiver clause is trying to do is trying to preserve uh, that right. And in particular in relation to delay, it's what it's saying is even though the party has delayed in enforcing its right, it's not necessarily waiving that right. So that's actually quite an important right for a party, especially if they're delaying in, in, in actually enforcing. So that was a very quick counter through and I will now hand you over to Ed. Thank you, Jatinda. So in the second part, we're going to try and run through as many of these boilerplate clauses as we possibly can. But just to pick up on something Jatinda said at the beginning, while these provisions often aren't given much attention at the beginning, pre-contract negotiations, often when something goes wrong, that's when you've got people crawling all over the contract to see what possibly helps or assists your case. And uh, these boilerplate provisions are often looked at in that context. So it's worth probably bearing that in mind. And I guess priority clauses, uh, follow on from Jatinda's point on entire agreements, which really look to try and pin down what's in and what's out of the contract. Um, we all know that construction contracts are often a whole collation of documents put together, drafted by different authors at different times and actually thrown together at the last minute to get into contract. So there's a lot of scope for discrepancies, errors and differences. Um, and typically when you're looking to interpret what those errors and discrepancies what they actually mean, how they should be, um, how it should play out. People often looked at, well, what was the intention of the parties at the beginning when they entered into the contract? What makes commercial common sense? But the Supreme Court case there below of Arnold and Britain is worth noting because it's a definite shift towards a more literal approach. Um, and the court saying, we're not going to put on our superheroes outfit and redraft the contract for you. We've actually got to look at the words in front of us. Now, one way you can look to hedge against documents conflicting each other is through a simple priority clause. And you sometimes see these at the beginning of contracts. And I've taken one I've seen um, not too long ago. And you can see that if you've got specific points that have a particular concern, it would be prudent to get it in the articles of agreement. Um, just one point to note on discrepancies. Often the standard forms are quite heavily amended. And quite often you'll see that they will say, well, actually, Issues regarding discrepancies or errors in contract documents sit with one party, most typically the contractor. And if there are those errors, they should have been picked up pre-contract and the risk in terms of time and money sits with the contractor. So they can be quite dangerous um, provisions if you don't pick up on them straight away. Next, we've got no or variations, or sometimes you might see them referred to as non-provisions. Um, variations are obviously a very key feature of construction contracts, and you may well have seen a provision not too dissimilar to this. Um, no variation of this agreement shall be effective unless it's in writing and signed by the parties. Now, those provisions did used to get challenged because the argument would be, well, we agreed that when we entered into the contract, but at a site meeting, that was clearly overridden between two parties who made an agreement. It was just oral. We have, thankfully, got some quite clear guidance from the Supreme Court, again on this, in the Rock Advertising case, that says the law should and does give effect to a contractual provision requiring spe specified formalities to be observed for a variation. In short, these provisions will get upheld. And you can see the justifications here down at the bottom. 
They prevent attempts to undermine written, uh, written agreements. All agreements can give rise to misunderstanding and uncertainty. A central pillar of contractual law is having contractual certainty. And again, at the bottom, they add to formalities in terms of recording and assist corporations um, in policing and authorising decisions and variations that are made in the contract. So that's all quite difficult to argue against, but it's worth being aware that if you've got these provisions, if you are acting on a variation without it being signed on the dotted line, it is being done at risk. And it would probably be prudent to have a, um, a simple form, template form of document so you can document such variations um, at speed. Another key feature of our contracts is subcontracting. And actually the law, if you look at it, it's quite accommodating to subcontracting. We've got the general rule here, which is contractual obligations that do not require personal performance by the contractor may be subcontracted unless otherwise prohibited by the contract. So the general position at law is one, the contractor can subcontract within reason, and two, they don't actually need to obtain consent. That said, many of the standard forms will seek to limit or qualify the basis on which subcontracting can occur. They'll say you can subcontract, but the subcontract's got to be on these terms, it's got to be signed as a deed, you need to have this PI, these warranties. So there's a number of hurdles you need to achieve. I've just swiped um, a clause from the JCT, which in my experience, a lot of contractors overlook or are caught out by when they actually um, have it enforced on them. If you have a look at the standard provisions of the JCT, the contractor shall, not without the employee's consent, subcontract the whole of the works or any part of the works. Now, that's quite onerous. Any element of subcontracting, you need to seek the consent of the employer. And a lot of people are caught out by that, um, particularly if you don't want to get in a discussion over a particular trade package that you're committed to going to, you're best getting it pre-approved up front. And just a point to note there, the consent is qualified by clause 1.10, which says the employee's consent may not be unreasonably delayed or withheld. Assignment's another point that we often see in, in our contracts. Um, the law, again, in terms of assignment, is actually quite wide and beneficial to the parties. So at common law, um, contractual benefits are freely assignable without the other party's consent. So if you want to restrict that right, you need express drafting in the contract. Quite typically, you will see that. Again, I believe the JCT DMB at clause seven looks to say assignment must take, um, must go ahead with the party's consent. And interestingly enough, that consent is not qualified by clause 1.10, so you don't have to be reasonable in giving or withholding such consent. Just a point always to note on assignment, you're assigning only the benefit, you can't assign the burden, so that's the obligation. So if I'm a contractor, the benefit of the contract to me is pretty much going to be um, getting paid, and as an employer, the benefit's going to be getting the right, the work's done, or the right to bring defects claims or the likes. Um, so typically you'll see the contracts, and what they'll do is they'll prohibit the contractor from assigning and give the um, employer a right to assign, typically on two occasions or in between group companies. What I've put on this slide at the bottom is probably a slightly more interesting point, just in terms of assignment on termination. A lot of the standard forms do deal with this in some way or the other. And at a termination scenario, the parties obviously aren't going to be as cooperative as they might have been at the beginning, but there is an obligation to assign the benefit of the subcontracts on termination. Now this can cause all sorts of problems to a contractor who's going to be facing claims down the line from the employer who's going to want to look to pass them on. If he assigns the rights to bring claims, he's actually going to be left scrambling around looking at contribution claims, which can pretty much put them on the back foot. So I think these are provisions that are going to come under a lot of scrutiny. Scrutiny. I mean, if I was a contractor, I'd typically looking, be looking to qualify this in some way or ensure I get a collateral warranty for my supply chain, so I've at least got a contractual right against them. And likewise, if I'm an employer, I wouldn't want to get in a debate on this at all. You'd probably be best annexing to the back of the contract a form of assignment so there could be no debate over the terms of it. But I think that's one that's going to be picked up um, by a lot of the standard forms in the coming years. Notices, again, very much overlooked pre-contract negotiations. I don't think I've ever had a heated negotiation on notice provisions. However, as soon as you're looking to terminate a contract or put a notice in last minute by uh, before a time limit, you're suddenly scrambling around looking to see what the notice provisions say. They're not always as clear as you might think. 
we've got the standard legal position, the famous uh, words from Lord Hoffman here. If the clause had said that the notice had to be on blue paper, it would have been no good serving a notice on pink paper. So very much calling for a strict interpretation of what the contract says and following the contract. And I guess just some practice points on notices down at the bottom there. Um, often people resist putting them in, they can be seen as being confrontational, but um, if the contract requires it, particularly if you've got time bars, it can only be counts against you if you don't, particularly on the likes of the waiver provisions that Jatinder mentioned. Again, the notices, the best notices are just factual, copying and pasting what the contract says and keeping it factual. They don't have to be emotive in any shape or form. And then things to check, how do they need to be served? A lot of contracts will prohibit um, service um, of certain notices by email. You just need to watch out for that. Interestingly enough, a lot still do reference facts, which um, could be room to cause some mischief there. And where to serve the notice, you want to check where the notice needs to be served. And there can be other requirements. Some contracts are quite prescriptive in terms of what language the notice has to be in and also the likes of who actually needs to serve it in the first place. In some circumstances, the engineer, the employee's agent can't actually serve certain notices. And when do they need to be served by just picks up on time bar provisions which can make their way into contracts. Force majeure, which I think Jatinda hinted at at the beginning. So this is very much, if you've got a force majeure provision, it's adding to uh, the position at law. You've got no force majeure provision at law. And what force majeure provisions uh, look to do is deal with performance of events beyond the party's reasonable control. I have to be honest, for years and years, I just overlooked force majeure provisions. I never really paid them much attention until COVID and Brexit came along. And they come under a lot more scrutiny now. And one of the key elements that you'll see is force majeure provisions have to take into account what is foreseeable or what could not have been foreseen. And that very much brings into play COVID and Brexit, because there's a very good argument that, that now COVID and Brexit just reflect tough market conditions. So if you've got specific concerns, in terms of labour, supply, price of materials, leading times for materials, you're probably going to need some quite specific drafting on the point. And if I was a contractor and it was a particularly important point to me, I'd be looking at my priority uh, clause if I'd managed to get one at the front and I'd want it as far as the top as I possibly could. We've got an example down there just below the NEC approach to um, its prevention events, um, force majeure, which again brings into um, account what should have been allowed for, what was foreseeable. A set off, again, um, quite often you'll see these in construction contracts. It acts as a defence uh, to a payment claim, so it's not a claim in of itself, it knocks off um, an amount that's been claimed against you. Um, some would say it's not only used as a defence, it's often used as an excuse um, to delay payment, but in principle the way it works is Let's say the employer owes the contractor £100, but in return the contractor owes £90, let's say, in LADs. You'd net that off to say employer makes payment of £10. That all makes sense, providing those figures are true and they stack up. And as I say, some gains can be played um, with set off and um, as an excuse to not make payment. So the right of set off um, is quite wide, actually. If you look at it as it arises at law, there's a Litigation right to set off, which actually applies across contracts. There's also an equitable right to set off that exists if um, the sums are closely related. So that would typically be under the same contract. There's also a right of insolvency set off, which occurs in an insolvency scenario where you let off what's due from the creditors and what's uh, left in the, um, the company. And that actually can't be excluded by law. And then at the bottom, we've got contractual set-off. So these are the types of set-off you would see in or making their way into a contract. And I've got some examples down here which are very one-sided. So in the first one, I think the employer is looking to completely um, put a block on the contractor's right to um, set-off or counterclaim. So let's say the subcontractor, um, let's say the contractor's owed, owed money, um, but the employer could then look to Bring, LAD, bring an LAD claim um, without the contractor looking to set off money that is rightfully owed to him. So they can delay prompt payment and also put the party on the back foot. And then there's a final example here, which the employer, by the looks of it, is looking to enhance and widen its right to set off. So 
it's making it apply to liabilities present or future, liquidated or unliquidated, and whether or not or not under this agreement or another agreement. So it's really enhancing its right to set off. And then I think just to wrap off here, termination. So if your contract's silent on termination, you're going to be relying on the common law rights to termination, which are pretty limited. You're looking at renunciation, repudiation breach, so those are breaches that go right to the root of the contract, a party showing no real intention to accept the obligations of the contract any further, or breach of a condition as opposed to a warranty, and conditions can be implied by statute or be expressly stated in the contract itself. Now, in a termination scenario, you typically want to be quite clear on what you're doing. So you do get um, termination provisions frequently drafted in that are a bit more express on certain points. So, for example, the right to terminate for insolvency or bankruptcy, that's not in and of itself a breach of contract. So you need to work that into the contract. A failure to proceed regularly and diligently. This is quite an interesting point. So if you want the right to terminate for the contractor failing to proceed regularly and diligently, you first need to have the obligation on them to proceed regularly and diligently, otherwise the obligation is just to meet the completion date. But quite often you will want that right in, so you'll see it making its way into contracts. Termination at will and omission of works, that's another interesting point that you do see making their way into contracts, but it always flags the question, what happens on loss of profit claims? Are they completely excluded? Are they capped? What happens if the employer suddenly just wants to walk away, rip up the contract and go somewhere else? And then you also see um, provisions saying, well, if we notify you of a breach and it's not completed within, let's say, 14 days or so, we will look to terminate. So those are all enhanced rights. And I guess one thing just to bear in mind um, at the bottom there is unless you've got an exclusive remedies provision that says only the remedies in the contract shall apply, these express terms for termination are on top of what the common law um, provides for in any case. So hopefully that's a quick run through. I think um, the take home point of this uh, webinar hopefully shouldn't be that you need to put all of these provisions in each and every contract of yours, but trying to find out where they're relevant. Super. Thank you, Edward and Jacinda. I think, um, yeah, that's time for some questions. But first, thanks so much for taking us through so, so clearly because <laughs> I think um, we all too often overlook and not pay enough attention to. Um, we've had a number of questions come in, so we'll, we'll take a couple. And um, those that we can't get to, um, please do email, email us and or we'll try and get back to you um, by email in due course. So let's go with um, this first one here. Is confidentiality already covered by law or should I be including specific drafting? Um, yeah, good question. Um, I think that there's a there is an equitable duty of confidentiality, which applies to information which has been disclosed in confidence. Um, <clears throat> but as with every kind of equitable um, claim, there are certain uh, hurdles that need to be you know jumped over in order to bring that claim, which can be quite difficult. I mean, equity, equitable claims are not simple to bring. Uh, examples of you have to come with clean hands, etc. It, it's a difficult claim to bring, although there is a there is a legal right. But I think if you if you've got a contract or you're in a situation where you are uh, confidentiality is a concern for the parties, then as we would say, in order for there to be clarity, etc. If there is a particular concern, then you should use express wording in the contract. So whilst there is this equitable claim that you could bring, ultimately, it's always always better in those circumstances when you have a specific concern to actually include them within the contract. Ed, would you do you want to add yeah, to that? I completely agree that there's the trade secret regulations, which does um, give some protection to trade secrets of commercial value, but I'm not aware of too much interpretation on that. And as Jatinda said, if, if there's any, if it's being raised as a concern pre-contract, you're best having some express drafting on the point. And in my experience, confidentiality clauses aren't typically um, offensive. They tend to get agreed and they can vary in nature, obviously. On some of the commercially sensitive projects, you have whole schedules dealing with uh, what happens with breaches, how they're dealt with indemnities, and you can have very enhanced protection. But um, 
in principle, a short and simple um, competency clause so makes sense, particularly if it's being uh, flagged as a concern pre contract. Great, thanks. Thank you. Um, next question has to do with counterpart clauses. Do you need a counterpart clause if executing a document as a counterpart? I would include, um, just to be clear on counterparts, so typically, typically you used to have one agreement signed by both parties and dated, very clear, and you could take certified copies. A counterpart is where you have two copies of the same agreement, one signed by one party, one signed by the other party, both dated, and if all the formalities are met, they should be treated as the same document. Technically, that can be done if all the formalities are met without the need for a counterpart clause. I, however, would always just put one in if you're going to do that, just because if you've got a contractual claim against you, probably the easiest way to get out of it is to argue the contract doesn't apply. And you just don't want to be roped into any arguments in terms of, well, I thought I was only signing part of the document. I would put a clear counterpart provision in. It just short circuits any of those arguments. Um, but as I say, particularly with deals being done across countries with people working from home, and that seems to be the most common way. Um, documents and particularly deeds are getting getting executed so you, technically you don't need one in but why not put one in yeah i think that comes that comes down to those right at the beginning of the um of the talk where we talked about there being four different types of boilerplate provisions and i think this probably falls within the category of number one which is doesn't add much to the contract in that it confirms and restates what the law is but sometimes for the for the sake of clarity, it, it might be worth putting the provision in. However, all it's doing is restating what the law effectively says and doesn't necessarily add anything more. So if you're looking to keep the clause down to a minimum, as long as you follow the formalities, then yes, there's probably, you could get away with not including that boilerplate provision if you're looking to, to limit the, the, the length of the contract. Fantastic, thanks. Thanks both. Um, we just have one last question here, and Jitinda, it might just be a, um, a recap on the entire agreement clauses that you um, pulled out before. Um, mm -hmm. The question is regarding entire agreement clauses. Does this clause exclude all prior agreements between the parties, or just those regarding the same subject matter? And they're just asking for a, a clarification on the exclusion. I think if you look at the, the wording of um, entire agreement clauses, the way it's drafted, and certainly the, the the entire agreement clause that I had up on the slide, goes on at the end of it to talk about this is the entire agreement, in, and I'm just reading it out, in connection with the subject matter of this agreement. So what it is trying to achieve there is saying, you know, the entire agreement clause is only meant to apply to the subject matter. So even though there's an agreement between the parties on something which is related to but not the same subject matter of this agreement then the entire agreement clause wouldn't apply but obviously it's always dependent on the drafting of the of the entire agreement clause but my understanding is if you as long as you've introduced that wording about the subject matter of this agreement then other agreements and side agreements on unrelated or slightly related matters would not fall within the entire agreements clause perfect thank you for clarifying thanks Jacinda. um that is um, all we have time for. I've seen a couple of questions come at the end, but we will um, get back to you on those. What I do need to do, though, before we close out is on a next slide or two, we've got what our next upcoming webinar um, in two weeks time. We have you may have um, heard that the new building safety bill was recently released on the 5th of July and we have our senior partner Simon Tolson here with us in two weeks time on Thursday the 29th giving us some updates um, on what has changed to that draft le legislation and what the implications are for the construction industry. So we do hope that you can join us again in two weeks time um, with Simon and that is all for today. Jatinda and Ed, thank you very much again for, for such a clear explanation. And thank you very much to our audience for being with us. And we hope that we can see you again soon. Thank you very much, everyone. Hope you stay safe.